Pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Julie Zimmerman. Uh, so, Julie's got like so many different titles and roles at Yale. There's really no point in trying to list them all off because it's labs, it's deans, it's professors, it's all these different things that are there. What I like to think of Julie as, and one of the things that's so incredible about her, is she's a human magnet. Um, she attracts all these different people from around Yale, from inside and outside the university. And she supports and helps and mentors folks. Um, she is somebody who gives of her time and her energy and her thought, and who is mentored and connected to a range of the different companies that you saw maybe presenting yesterday, um, or folks like staff who came through and were just pre presenting earlier. Um, and she's one of the kind of like representations of one of the most fun things about being at Yale is that like sometimes you'll just wander in and be around the street and like you're next to a Nobel laureate or the person who created like the 12 principles of green chemistry and engineering and something else that other people teach all around the place. So in the summit, we were really excited to feature some of the faculty that push, pull, connect, support, engage with alumni, students, and their colleagues and make the university really a better place and a more interesting place to be. And Julie is really one of the kind of leading lights on that. So. Thank you for your time and attention. The floor is Julie's, um, and throw the listen to her. Thanks, Stu. That's a tough introduction to you. I will do my best. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about sustainable innovation and how we think about addressing planetary solutions. But I'm going to start with what we used to think about as being really absurd historically. So women not having the right to vote was absurd. We look back on that and think that's crazy. 
we talk about doctors telling people to smoke because it's good for their health. And that was insane. And how could people have thought about that back then as being a good thing? You could talk about leaching to cure medical illness or that the earth is flat. And if we pause and we start thinking about today, what's absurd? And what are people in the future going to look back on us and say, that is crazy. How did society ever believe that or let that happen? Here are some of those examples. The largest product of the chemical industry is carbon dioxide. The largest product of our pharmaceutical sector is waste solvent. We consume about 767 billion cubic meters of natural gas in the US, and we flare off about 20% of that annually. Just burn it. If you look at the economic value of that, let alone the carbon emissions, we're in the billions of dollars of gas that we're just flaring off. It's absurd. And people in the future are going to look back and think, this was crazy. We flush about 2.3 billion gallons of drinking water per day in the US. That's enough to meet the daily potable water demand for all of Africa in a given day. And we just flush that down the toilet. 40% of our global energy production comes from coal, and 40% of global energy production is for fertilizer production. That is absurd. People in the future are going to look back and think this is crazy. Studies coming out of Ellen MacArthur Foundation, there will be a little over one megaton of fish in the ocean by 2050, and there will also be a little over one megaton of plastic in the ocean by 2050. Absurd. And in 2015, the Center for Disease Control here in the U.S. started doing analysis to look at what's present. They call it body burden, how many chemicals we have in our bodies. 287 different synthetic chemicals are found in the umbilical cord of newborns. Of these, 180 are known carcinogens, 208 developmental toxins, and several have been banned since the 1970s. So our answer is, well, we'll just regulate it. We'll ban it. The problem is, is even when we put those bands in place, these chemicals are persistent in the environment and they're showing up in living things from polar bears to penguins to the umbilical cords of newborns. These are all unintended consequences of our industrial systems. This is not the intent. The chemical sector doesn't intend to produce carbon dioxide as their main product. Pharma is not trying to produce solvents. The elephant in the room and the thing that's really uncomfortable and the question we need to ask ourselves is, is it possible that the exact thing that gave us all of our successes and victories in the past are the exact things that are contributing to our demise? So I'm an engineer by training all the way through. I did my PhD at uh, University of Michigan in engineering. And this is what we were taught. Like, there's a problem, and you're an engineer, and you're really creative, and we're going to teach you how to problem solve, and you're going to come up with a solution. <laughs> Sorry, wrong button. And this has worked great, right? You can look at transportation, wastewater, communication, manufacturing, healthcare. It doesn't matter, right? Engineering, science has contributed. These technologies have made tremendous advances to societal benefits and to addressing global challenges. There's just one problem with how we've gone about this. We often have only been solving half a problem statement. So we were challenged to provide clean water for people to have to drink, but we forgot to say, oh, can you do that without using and generating toxic chemicals? Or, hey, we need you guys to generate energy. But can you do it without altering Earth's atmosphere at the same time? We need you to produce goods and services for societal needs, but can you do it without depleting finite resources and generating waste? And you can go on and on to all these examples. And so we have to ask ourselves if we're approaching climate change in the same way. And so there's this kind of story or framework of this carbon tunnel vision of companies saying, we know that energy is linked to climate, and climate's linked to food, and food is linked to water, and water's linked to health. But our goal is going to be reducing our carbon footprint by some percentage by 2030 or 2040. And if we focus solely on carbon and ignore the rest of these other considerations when we think about sustainability, we're going to create the same kind of absurdities today in how we're trying to solve our sustainability challenges. 
So our solutions really must meet societal needs in ways that are conducive to life today and into the future. And that has to be part of every problem statement that we put out going forward to think about when we're designing solutions. So how are we going to get these problem statements right? It's the same way we're going to get our solutions right. And the first thing is to start coupling reductionism with systems thinking. So reductionism has taken us really far. This is all of the work that has gone on historically in science and engineering labs is I'm going to hold all parameters constant. I'm going to change one variable, and I'm going to see what results I get. And that's great. And it's given us really fundamental knowledge of how systems and parameters interact with each other. The problem is, is that that view of reductionism doesn't help inform how to reconstruct the system, what the feedback loops are, and what those potential unintended consequences are. This is not a new idea. This is a paper that came out by P.W. Anderson. He was a Nobel laureate. He published this in Science in 1972, and it was this paper called More is Different. And the main takeaway from the paper is this idea that if we use a reductionist hypothesis, it does not imply a constructionist one. The ability to reduce everything to simple fundamental laws does not imply the ability to start from those laws and recreate the universe. So if we don't start coupling reductionism with systems thinking, we're going to create these unintended consequences and the absurdities of today. And just to hit this home, right, I can take a VW Golf, I can disassemble it into all its, its uh, incremental parts. Each one was designed, each one was engineered. But if I don't know how to put those back together, this car can't drive and can't work as a system. So understanding each individual component is great and important, and they all need to be engineered and designed. But I also need to know how they interact, what the feedbacks are, how they fit together, how they work together to get the function or the service that I want. Beyond thinking about reductionism and systems thinking, I need a couple innovation with sustainability. So if I am creating new things and I'm not doing it within a sustainability framework, I am not going to create sustainable solutions. I would also argue that we cannot get to a sustainable future with what we have today. We need innovation. So these two things must work together. And then what the panel was really talking about is moving from discovery to development and then really moving from implementation to scale. So these are all great goals. And this is how we need to move forward. But as Robert F. Kennedy said, progress is a nice word, but change. And change is its motivator, but change has its enemies. So what is stopping us from moving forward? What is holding us back? So how many people today in this room, raise your hand if you think that efficiency is a good thing? OK. I'm going to tell you efficiency actually has <laughs> no value. It has no desirability. It has no nobility. So pursuing efficiency for efficiency's sake actually isn't going to solve our problem. Do you want a really efficient criminal? <laughs> what about a very efficient virus? What about a really efficient carcinogen? So the value of an action doesn't come from whether or not it's efficient. It comes from the value of the action itself. So just pursuing sustainability uh, sorry, efficiency on an unsustainable system isn't going to move us forward. And this is a really important point. Because for years, we've been trying to measure sustainability improvements by whether or not they're efficient. Can I use fossil fuels a little bit more efficiently? Can I get a little bit more mileage out of my diesel truck? Can I have more efficient insulation? So I am trying to improve what is inherently an unsustainable system. It might buy us some time, but it is not going to get us where we need to go. And so remember, efficiency will help you do the things that you're doing better, but it will not help you do better things. So worshiping at the altar of efficiency is not going to drive the kind of sustainable innovations we need. These are not incremental improvements to simply doing a little bit less bad. This is not going to help us actually do good. There's actually nothing about sustainability that requires efficiency. Nature is tremendously material and energy inefficient. 
So you could talk about photosynthesis, right? A leaf less than 1% of the sunlight that hits that leaf is actually converted into chemical energy. DNA replication, incredibly inefficient process. When you think about messenger RNA and tRNA and all of the places that mutations and things can go wrong, think about how many seeds are dispersed out into the environment versus the number that actually germinate into new plants. So nature is not very efficient, but it is very effective. Right? And you can step back and look at the cherry blossoms around the tidal basin in BC or in Kyoto, Japan. Right? This is not efficient, but it is very effective. All of those blossoms that come out actually right if they're not converted into fruit and they're not turned into new plants fall to the ground and are fertilizer for the next season's growth nature is very effective but not very efficient and for those of you who don't think around nat natural terms here's a mozart's piano concerto I could take a two by four and I could hit a piano and I could hit every single one of those notes at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it would be very efficient, but it would not be very effective. So here's the challenge, right? If we want to make this progress, if we want to make these changes, we are threatening the status quo. We are threatening what is today, what exists. And the status quo often fights back, and it fights back really hard. So the people who have made the rules and benefited from those rules are not happy when the rules change, even if that change is good and necessary and just. So we need to ask, what is the status quo telling us? What are, what are truths, and what are the lies or the myths that the status quo tells us to fight back against implementing these sustainable innovations at scale? And it's really around the metrics that we use that is the status quo that tells us what's a good business decision, what's a good design decision, what's a good policy change, what's a good investment to make. Right? We all hear this. What gets measured gets managed. And it used to be that we wanted quantifiable metrics to know if what we were doing was good or not. And now we say something is good if I can apply a quantitative metric to it. Right? The tail is wagging the dog in this case. So I'm going to put up this chart. It's not an eye chart. It is a report from the National Academy of uh, Science and Engineering here in the US, where they put out and they said, what are the metrics? What are the tools that we have available to make decisions around sustainability? And if it has a green dot all the way across, it means it's been developed, applied, adopted, accepted, and validated. Yellow, it's in development, and red, it's really an academic exercise at this point. And if you look across this, the only things that are green all the way across are cost-benefit analysis and risk assessment. Okay, so those are, that is the status quo. Those are the tools of the status quo that we have. We don't do cost-benefit very well. We don't measure costs very well when we talk about externalities, and we're really bad about quantifying co-benefits and this idea of systemic change. And when we talk about risk assessment, risk assessment tells us that putting things like the Fukushima nuclear reactor on the coast of Japan was a good decision. Putting the oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico and Deepwater Horizon right, was a good decision because I can do a risk assessment and it's that black swan event where I'm going to have a catastrophic failure. So we know black swan events happen and we're actually facing a flock of black swans if we think about everything from climate change to war to what's going on with the economy. So if we're relying on cost benefit and risk assessment to tell us whether our new ideas are good, they don't come out on top because the status quo's tools aren't designed to measure sustainable solutions. We can't quantify them well, and so it makes it really hard to argue for investment, for change in policy, for adoption of new technologies. I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but it is said that Einstein in his office at Princeton had a sign on his wall that said, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. And so when we talk about things like justice, or beauty, or love, or freedom, we don't have quantifiable metrics. Freedom isn't a measure of how many people are in prison. Right? And so we do this every day in our daily lives and think in not quantifiable metric terms and think in systems, but we have a really hard time when we go into a boardroom, we go into a scientific lab, we go in for a pitch, 
to using metrics that are not cost-benefit analysis and risk assessment. So we want to focus on the direction, the compass. Are we heading towards true north of a sustainable future? And not how fast we're going. How efficiently are we moving? Because if we're moving in the wrong direction, it doesn't matter how fast we get there. So I'm going to ask you to imagine what this world would look like if we could manufacture new high-value chemicals that don't use carcinogens but use simple sugars instead. Or a world where high-value materials are synthesized not from things that are persistent and bioaccumulating and toxic, but instead use renewable feedstocks. What if we live in a world where we get all the function of a product without the product itself? What if nature was actually our greatest teacher, mentor, and design partner? What if we actually took the lessons of nature and applied them in how we do our engineered systems? What if our engine, engine, energy systems were healthful, renewable, and degradable? What if the material basis of our economy and our society was benign to human health and the environment? Now imagine that you're not imagining these things. So we can manufacture new high value chemicals from simple sugars. We do this in the lab. We have another spin out in addition to the air company that staff talked about earlier called P2 Science that's based here in Connecticut. They're here in Nagatak. They're renewable flavors and fragrance companies. They're primarily in the personal care space. And they have really radically liberal partners and people using their products like Chanel and L'Oreal and Estee Lauder. <laughs> and if you go into CVS, you can actually buy living proof products that have P2 ingredients included in them. What if we wanted to make these high value materials from renewable feedstocks? So we can do this. We have and have demonstrated, and there's a um, plant up in Finland and Norway that is actually taking wood and making vanillin, so vanilla flavoring from lignin, right? So you have cellulose and lignin. Cellulose people ferment, make ethanol. Lignin is often burned. We can make chemicals out of this, like vanillin. The climate impact of this process versus making synthetic vanillin from petroleum has about 29 times less. CO2 impact associated with it. And the nice thing is if we move to a system like this, we're not doing deforestation in places like Madagascar to plant plantations to grow vanilla. So can I make these chemicals from renewable feedstocks with less environmental impact? What if we get all the function from a product without the product? So dyes are notoriously one of the most difficult uh, chemicals in terms of persistence and fate in the environment and hazard. How many dyes or pigments are in one of these peacock feathers? None. Mm -hmm. So we get all the color, the function of color by refractive light. So the shape of the feather actually bends the light. You see color, but there's no dye or pigment actually in a peacock feather. They're quite brilliant and beautiful. Nobody would argue we're not getting enough function or color as a result of not having a synthetic dye associated with it. So you can apply this same technology to things like coffee decaffeination. Coffee right now is decaffeinated using organic solvent. It's called methylene chloride. It's a suspected human carcinogen. Nobody walks into Starbucks and orders a vanilla decaf latte with a little bit of carcinogen. Nobody wants to drink carcinogen or be exposed to this. There have been green technologies that have come up that use things like uh, water under really high temperature and pressure or carbon dioxide under high temperature and pressure to replace that organic solvent. They represent 5% of the market, methylene chloride 95% of the market for coffee decaffeination. <laughs> Why is really expensive. CapEx is really high. As you heard staff talk about building out at scale, pipes in the ground, really hard to get investment for. Why don't we just grow coffee plants without caffeine? I'm getting all the function that I wanted of decaffeinating coffee without using an organic solvent and without having to raise CapEx and OpEx costs and manage a plant, uh, industrial facility, a chemical plant, right? So what is the function? What's the most sustainable way of getting that function or service rather than how do I design a greener solution? 
If nature is our greatest teacher, mentor, and design partner, right, this gecko is sticking to the ceiling, to the wall, takes its feet off, puts its feet back on. The gecko does not have to get a spackle knife out and right, get its foot off the wall to be able to reapply it. People would argue it has greater function because we don't lose stickiness from a gecko foot. If you look under a microscope at gecko feet, they have small keratin fibers, protein fibers that create interactions with surfaces through weak force interactions or van der Waals forces. And there is product on the market now called gecko tape. So I'm getting all the function of an adhesive without an adhesive chemical, without a molecule, without a supply chain. Okay, I'm going to show you a little video just in case you have any doubts if nature is better than you. <laughs> <laughs> I will remind you that nature has 3.4 billion years of evolution under its belt. It has been doing design a lot better and a lot longer than us. If you're an octopus or a cephalopod, you need to really understand how to use your surroundings to hide. In the next scene, you're going to see a nice coral bottom. And you'd see that an octopus would stand out very easily there if you couldn't use your camouflage, use your skin to change color and texture. Here's some algae in the foreground and an octopus. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Now, Roger spooked him, so he took off, a cloud of ink, lands. And when he lands, the octopus says, look, I've been seen. Best thing to do is get as big as I can get. That big brown makes his eye spot very big. So he's bluffing. Let's do it backwards. I thought he was joking when he first showed it to me. I thought it was all graphics. So here, here it is in reverse. Watch the skin color. Watch the skin texture. Just an amazing animal. Can change color and texture to match the surroundings. Watch him blend right into this algae. One, two, three. Okay, so if you're in the military, right, this is super interesting. Then remember this octopus is doing it with local material and energy sources. <laughs> <laughs> Using solar energy at ambient temperature and pressure. Any waste that's generated from the process is consumed by something else in the ocean. No? Okay. If you're an octopus or a cephalopod, you need to re octopus or a cephalopod. So we're starting to figure out how to do this. So this is the new BMW concept car, based on the same technology. Okay, so super exciting. If you drive by and you're in a red car and the police sees you, you can... <laughs> <laughs> you can have a blue car, you can have a striped car. So. This technology, this idea of using electrochemistry to change texture, color, super interesting applications for military to consumer goods. What if our renewable energy systems were, were healthful, renewable, and degradable? We talked a little bit about biofuels from one of the questions. We do a lot of work on algae, direct air capture. You heard about staff, an air company that's taking CO2 out of the atmosphere to produce sustainable aviation fuels. What if the material basis of our economy and our society is benign to human health and the environment? What if all those absurdities from producing chemicals and materials and services didn't lead to those unintended consequences and absurdities? Where's the chemical plant in this picture? Everywhere, yeah? Except for these houses that are sitting right in front. These are often called fence line communities. We've often uh, started to hear a new term called sacrifice zones. These are people who tend to be disproportionately disadvantaged, lower socioeconomic people of color who bear the burden of releases and emissions from those chemical plants, from chemical accidents. Um, this is a cost that is not, again, figured into that cost-benefit analysis or that risk assessment in an accurate way. This is a trade-off of what is the burden for this community versus the overall benefit to society? What staff didn't talk about is this is Airco's uh, research facility right here, this little gray garage on Johnson Street in Brooklyn. They're in a neighborhood. You wouldn't know there's chemical manufacturing going on there. This changes the entire idea of what if I could have a chemical plant located in my community? I could get economic development. I have a tax base doesn't affect my real estate value. Um, it has to do with intergenerational wealth. It has to do with environmental justice. 
And so if I move to a safer basis for material, energy, and chemicals, I can start changing what that relationship is of not in my backyard to please come locate in my community. We recently published a paper on this about green chemistry as just chemistry, as in we're just doing our chemistry that we always do, but it's also just in terms of environmental justice. So I'm going to end on and let you know that we've also done this work on a periodic table of elements of green and sustainable chemistry. It was the anniversary of the periodic table, and we said, those elements are great, but they're not the elements that are going to get us to a sustainable future. These elements in the middle are really what scientists, chemists, and engineers do. These are the elements of green chemistry and green engineering. These are the technologies that we hear about, whether it's using CO2, whether it's catalysis, whether it's renewable feedstocks. Um, but you'll see on the other sides of the periodic table, we need these enabling systems conditions. And this is what everybody should do. These are things like policies. These are things like new metrics. Um, these are things like communications. This is economics. This is figuring out how to do cost in terms of externalities and calculating co-benefits. So this is a book. There's a QR code. You're welcome to scan it. If you do, you'll get a free copy of the book. Um, I'll put that back up while I'm answering questions. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I promise I'll put it back up. <laughs> so for the past couple of decades, the question has really been, can we design, develop, and scale sustainable solutions to our planetary challenges? Can we do it? Can the scientists and engineers figure it out? Can the technology be made? Can we provide the same level of function and service without the unintended consequences, without the absurdities? And we can because we have. We've demonstrated it. You've surrounded by it from the pitches of these new ideas to established companies to large companies to startups that this is possible. The question now is, will we? And that is really all of the parts that are holding us back. That is the status quo fighting back. That is not having the right metrics. That is policy not aligned. That is the incentives not there to make these changes. So I'll end on a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. The difference between what we do and what we are capable of doing would more than suffice to solve most of the world's problems. And I will stop there. I'm happy to take some questions. landscape from creating the innovation versus actually helping create the system, the metrics, and spinning this out and scaling this up? Yeah, I think there's a very big changing role for academia. I think historically, right, we have this idea of the ivory tower of knowledge for knowledge's sake. There's even a perception, even in some parts of Yale to this day, that if I have an application for the knowledge I've created, it's less pure, it's less noble. Um, and so there is a shift in how academia plays in this and our role because we are being driven, one, by our students and being asked by society as a service, right, as a creator of knowledge to change what we're doing and how we're doing it. But it requires a culture change at the university without a doubt. This is everything from, you know, how tenure counts and patents count to journal articles and publications. This changes interdisciplinary work versus single investigator and who gets credit for the work that we're doing. Um, this is a different funding structure. Me writing a grant by myself in my office to get money for my research versus how do I work across the university and share credit, share benefits, share resources. So there's a lot of shift that has to change in the culture of universities and academia and some schools are doing this and doing it really well and demonstrating that's effective. Um, Arizona State is one that comes to mind that has basically disbanded academic departments and organized around problems instead. So there's a school of the built environment, there's a school of energy, and whether I'm an anthropologist or an economist or an engineer working on that problem, I sit in that school instead of sitting with my disciplinary colleagues. 
So there are new models, and I think academia will continue to evolve because we have to, and I think we have a moral imperative to do so. Yeah? How do you think about prioritizing problems uh, when you're not measuring outcomes? Well, I didn't say we shouldn't measure outcomes. <laughs> I, don't, I just don't think that the metrics that we have today that are adopted and accepted, like risk and cost-benefit, are measuring real outcomes. Because if they were, the biggest product of the chemical sector wouldn't be carbon dioxide and from pharma wouldn't be waste solvent, right? So something is wrong with how we're deciding which technologies should go to scale and which processes we should use to get there. So we need to measure outcomes, but the outcomes we're measuring right now are not giving us answers that are pushing us in a sustainable direction. Yeah? Aren't you really arguing for a more holistic, all-encompassing view of the consequences of whatever we're doing? In other words, a more broad-based uh, uh, take energy generation and all the consequences. We need energy. We have to do that. Uh, we just have to figure out what are the consequences. I think that's your argument on the other side of it. Um, you know, for instance, uh, if we look at plant-based meat, it requires a lot of processing today. Obviously, research needs to be done to fix that, uh, but at the right direction. Uh, but you're arguing, I think, for a more holistic viewpoint. What are the secondary and tertiary consequences. Yeah, and I think that's the difference between reductionism, which academia has historically been focused on, versus systems thinking. What are these interactions? What are feedback loops? Um, rather than having tunnel vision on just, I need to make plant-based meat, and I don't care what the other impacts are as long as I provide that service or function. Maybe you could put those parameters in uh, that GPT and ask God, uh, or whatever, to figure out what are the least consequences in weight yet. You have a lot more faith in chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so really risking ROI capitalism. Um, have you seen incentives or have you seen ways to sort of flip the system around so capitalism buys into this and can reduce the risk and increase the ROI by doing something sustainable? What, what are the models that work best for you? Because that's the system we've had for the last 150 years for better yeah, so I will say two things. One is we have to figure out how to use capitalism to our advantage to, to do this, right? So, and this is uncomfortable for a lot of people, but this is the people who are making money today off the problems also need to make money off the solutions, or they're never going to let us go forward. And that's really hard for people to take. But if you think about what staff is talking about, where all the hydrogen in the world is sitting, it's sitting in the big oil and gas companies right now, and we need that to go to scale. Um, and the other thing to say is, ROI works, but you know we say, oh, toxic is cheap. I use toxic chemicals because it's cheap. But the healthcare impacts and the healthcare costs that are being borne from society for being exposed to these persistent bioaccumulating toxic chemicals are not figured into your ROI as the manufacturer. And so we need to somehow start having right carbon tax, harm charge, whatever it is of I am causing cost to somebody else that's outside of my spreadsheet, but it's on somebody else's spreadsheet. And so we need to use capitalism to bring those in so that the real costs are represented when we're making these decisions. That's regulation. I mean, Larry Summers talked about that yesterday, right? He said yeah. the greatest failures of capitalism still help society, whether it was railroads, which meant mostly failed, and uh, you know, the internet lines that most companies, those companies failed as well, but the infrastructure was there. So yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's regulation. It's, it's regulation and, I mean, regulation is a floor. We also want to drive continuous improvement, and so we don't want to race to the bottom, so there has to be carrots and incentives to also drive innovation, because otherwise everybody will race to the bottom of whatever that regulatory floor is. Socialism. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, I'd argue the VCs aren't quite there yet. Yes. <laughs> uh, if you are VC there, I'd love to talk to you. I was thinking of you a little bit, yeah. So how as an entrepreneur, we're just trying to stay alive, honestly, do you incorporate this? Are there tactical ways that you've seen that startups can do this and also kind of get to the milestones they need to? Yeah, I think this is a great question. I mean, I think a little bit of this is needling at the VCs because you need a simple story. I mean, we've watched this with P2. We've watched this with Airco. 
you know, are you a vodka company? Or are you a fuel company? Or are you a fragrant? Like, what are you? And then how can I invest in you? P2 face that same thing because they have a portfolio of products. Um, I think it is really hard, and I think the conversation with v VCs, especially in the space, is we're not an app. You're not going to get ROI in five years, right? Like, it is really different to have to put pipes in the ground, to have to go to scale. You need patient capital. Um, and you need to think about how that continuum works of really high risk, high reward to longer term private equity. And so how do we stretch out and find partnerships between VC and private equity so that you invest in a fund instead of an individual company and so the risks are distributed? I think there are different models for investing that we can pursue, but I agree with you that VC firms have to shift a lot in their mentality from the tech space to this space. Yeah. It sounds like it's a problem that we don't know what we don't know. And so what is it where what side effects should we measure? And we can find the side effects in a laboratory or by measuring the temperature of the earth. And uh, the alternative seem to be to measure things that we have no concept of relevance for. <coughs> so how do you solve that? Wait, can, can you say more of what we have no relevance for? We don't know what side effects there may be, and we have no concept of what they might be. So what is it that we test? So I think I would say we know a lot more than we used to, right? So when, Always. So when CFCs came out, we thought, this is great, right? We've solved this refrigeration problem. We're not using ammonia. It's not going to explode anymore. And then, oh, but it interacts with the uh, ozone layer. And so we're going to make HCFCs, and oh, that is also a greenhouse gas. So I think this idea of we have a lot more computational power and machine learning, right? We have a lot better understanding of the chemistry of the processes we're putting out, whether it's on toxicity, whether it's on um, environmental impacts, whether it's on global hazards like flammability, explosivity. So I think we can start to understand from physical chemical properties how likely is this to be a problem when it gets out. And then it is understanding these systems. What are these interconnections? What are these feedbacks? Um, yeah, it's a new science. And it's uncomfortable because people are really used to reductionism, but it doesn't mean it's less valuable or less rigorous. It's just it's less familiar right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it viable, and how far in the future will organizations like Starbucks start investing in decaf coffee that is not carcinogenic, or for that matter, put up signs saying uh, decaf does have possibilities of damaging your health? Yeah, I, you know, I, I kind of kid around. Like, I don't know why people drink decaf coffee anyway, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, the question, it, your question is a really interesting one because it is, is it on Starbucks as a retailer? Is it on the coffee decaffeination folks? Is it because we don't have a charge associated with an economic signal that using carcinogens is not okay in consumer products and exposing people because they don't bear the health cost of what that might cause downstream? And so it's who and where in the system do we need to start having signals that this isn't okay or, you know, a just or good process to go forward with. Um, I, I don't know if Starbucks will come forward and do it. And is it on Starbucks to do it? I, that's another question, I think, to ask. Don't, yeah. don't you believe, though, that it's happening today? If you look at the forever chemicals, the PFOS, P, PFOS that, that the chemical companies developed years ago for nonstick cookware and other benefits that we all enjoy, and now they're being sued literally by every water utility, every wastewater utility to compensate for what's needed to take those chemicals out. So that, so that paradigm shift, I think, is starting to happen because the chemical companies are now <coughs> going to bear the burden for cleaning up something that they thought was safe. So what I, they, I don't... They knew. Dow Chemical knew that some of those... No, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that. I put quotes. I said thought. <laughs> I did, I did, I did, I did. Maybe GE didn't know that there were PCBs in the cleaning stuff they dumped in the right, Hudson yeah, yeah, in yeah, the 50s. I'm not arguing that. I'm not arguing, but, but I think so, that what I'm yeah, trying yeah, to say is so, that the change is occurring. I think what's challenging is, and what we've seen with... PFAS and these forever chemicals or bisphenol A, right, endocrine disrupting chemicals is 
Um, people are and will say, I'm not going to use that anymore, but we often see a regrettable substitution. So right. we see them put a label on to a consumer, this doesn't have PFAS. But the consumer doesn't say, well, PFAS was in there to serve a function. What did you put in instead to replace it, and is it any better? And often, some of these new chemicals that we develop, we don't have the same history on, so I don't actually know if they're better or worse. Um, and so this idea of regrettable substitution is a really dangerous one of just saying you have to get rid of that and put something else in without having standards on what we expect those alternatives to be, demonstrating they're safer, doing this kind of systems analysis to understand what we're going forward with as a replacement. Because not using something is not a good metric. So what I, actually what I'm trying to say is kind of goes on what his comment was that chemical companies, because of the potential impact, financial impact they're going to have in the future, I think will shift their paradigm to start focusing on what you talked about, the system thinking, to, to prevent prevent that. Do you think that would happen or you think you're, you're very that? optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean the cost to Dow Chemical to clean up or DuPont for these PFAS is less than one percent of what their profits are in a year. Yeah. So the, the financial signal isn't big enough for them to make that change. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, so so one example of greater systems thinking, which I know is happening here at the university now, is not just to consider this in the context of SOM, but the forestry school and the law school. So one of the things that we could do is look historically at um, the litigation costs um, for some of these factors. Um, and on the one hand, people might say, well, that's just going to stifle innovation. But what we have to have is a system where we foster innovation and we say, look, you're looking for nonstick, right? Everyone wants nonstick. So we come up with this PFAS. Great. But you then continue to use it until you get uh, deleterious information on it. And once you do, then you say, OK, I'll stop. Now, the problem is there's been huge capex expended in the production of it. And people get very grumpy because they don't want to have to shut down their plants, um, because their 401ks and other things are going to go to the toilet. But guess what? The option is that or children with PFAS and their umbilical Boards going forward. So I think from a this is really a policy discussion that we have to have about how to simultaneously encourage innovation, but then move more quickly to change when we find adverse information regarding some of these things. So I think right one is this is a very US centric view. So in the EU they have a very different approach and a much more precautionary principle approach. But there are policy levers. There are Things to say, you get R&D tax credits if you can demonstrate it's a green chemistry technology. You can do things like patent life extension if you meet certain, right, especially for pharma. You've used a green synthesis route, you've demonstrated it, we'll give you an extra two years on that active ingredient. That is worth more than anything else that we could do. And so there are policy levers to pull that aren't regulatory, that are incentive based to get companies to move in this direction. But I agree, right? That was the periodic table. It's not just the science, it's all of these enabling system conditions to get those things at scale in the market. <clears throat> One more question. Go ahead, I'm gonna let you. Oh no, you got it. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So I, I work in, I, your, your precautionary notes about there's resistance to change, I work in change leadership in large companies, and boy, there's, there is a lot of resistance to change. So I appreciate that precautionary measure. A lot of what we're dealing with, I live in a community that's completely contaminated by PCPs, by General Electric and Monsanto, and there's big suits going on, and it's, it's a big mess. So I also take your point about environmental justice. Aren't we, in, I'm just giving you an optimistic question. Okay, let's just, let's assume that the university tends going in the direction of greater good. Are we not dealing with the legacy of a lot of thinking that came out of the post-World War II chemistry experiment that we're all living, and that there's those, those executives and the people that they're hiring are now actually have a different worldview, and they know that they can't keep making a mess? Because I that's what I witness in a lot of companies, the CEOs I work with. They're like saying, you know, we actually have to be accountable to setting the standards that we know it should exist. 
Yes. Is, that not, is there not a change? There is. I do. I mean, license to operate means something different now than it used yeah. to, right? So I do think, yes, I do agree with you. I mean, I worked at EPA before I came to Yale, and our joke was progress happens one retirement at a time. <laughs> right? But it is. It is a new generation. I think people are asking different questions. Consumers are behaving differently. It's just, is that time scale fast enough? Is that change happening fast right. enough to actually address the problems that we have today. Good question. Yeah. Any closing thoughts? I'm good. All right. <laughs> Here you go. So if you would like to be magnetized or connected or have your velocity increased, Julia will be outside to chat with folks as well. But, you know, she just adopted a new puppy, so she's given all of her energy to this right now. So if you if you see her face go a little bit blank, it's because she's just running out of gas. So give her a, give her a second to recover. Um, we're going to get set up for our next session. We'll need the front row clear for all of our judges for the pitch competition. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.
Welcome, everyone.